Now I wait for 15 seconds to make sure uh, my audio is going through. The most <laughs> anxious first few seconds of every live stream where I wait for that. Not anxious, anxiety inducing is the word. I'm just right, right now if you're watching this, I'm just making sure you all can hear me perfect and I'm just making sure I can listen to myself. Perfect. I can hear myself. The audio looks like it's going to the mic and not the mother mic, which I usually mess up more often than not. Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for joining the study group. Every week we meet to learn from top Kaggle solutions. Top Kagglers have uh, really golden nuggets of knowledge. And some people just don't just want to get banned from the chat. Ayushman will keep trying to constantly get banned from the chat. But I feel top Kagglers always have these golden nuggets and we come back to learn from them. Uh, I have been interviewing them and now I feel like I'm at a stage where I can explain the solutions. So that's why we meet every week. Today we're learning from this competition. And my life will peak when Kaggle decides to run a competition on how many tabs I have open. So I bet there's a lot of data on this. They can just like do whatever they want. And if anyone can <laughs> guess the right number of tabs... Uh, I guess this just might become a competition sometime. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, I always, by the way, fun fact, I always get rate limited and I'm always worried if like someone from Kaggle will reach out and tell me, hey, you're like just, you're spamming the website or something like that just because I like open so many tabs. Many times I get like a cool down where I can't access the website. Anyways. Uh, hey, Surya, great to see you again. Enough, enough chit chat. Let's jump into this. So I'll explain this competition. I'll also explain a bit of metric learning. For that, I'm trying to spin up an instance of Hydrogen Torch, uh, which I did show last week as well, but it might take a few minutes. So let's jump into this in the meantime. This competition was called Happy Whale, uh, Whale and Dolphin Identification. If this name sounds somewhat familiar, there was a similar competition a few years ago. I think four years ago, it was one of my first competitions. There you were just supposed to identify whales and it was called Humpback Whale Identification. Here, it's like, of course, much more challenging and you're supposed to identify whales and dolphins by the unique characteristic. So let's, let's, re let's read a bit more of what you're supposed to do. And Ayushman is saying this competition was really hard. By the way, shout out to Ayushman. I hopped on a call with him and he like very kindly explained a few things to me. Uh, I, I think he's one of the smartest people working on computer vision in India, if not worldwide. Ayushman, if you could please drop the link to your uh, profile, I'll highlight that. He says many sleepless nights. I don't think you sleep anyways, right? So... The hosts say we use fingerprints and facial recognition to identify people. But can we use similar approaches with animals? I mean, no one has ever done that, right? And there's not a lot of research into this. There's not a lot of open discussion as well. So how do you tag these uh, animals? If you ever been to like wild... Uh, wildlife reserves and whatnot, they have different ways of actually physically tagging animals, right? In a way that's like not hurtful to them. So they like put some marks sometimes or they have these tags. For cows, I think they like hang tags from their ears. It looks painful, but I've been told it's not. So many wildlife workers and people who work in this actually like go to such areas and they need to make sure all of the animals are healthy for, for their welfare. So can, can we use like a model to easily identify all such animals and especially in this case, whales and dolphins to make their life easy? That was the challenge here, simply put. And they say most research institutes rely on mostly human eye. And that's what they're trying to uh, automate, if I may hear, or improve upon and like help the, help the people or the folks working at such institutions. That's my guess. The submission were uh, evaluated by a map at five, which means you were supposed to predict the top five predictions, as I understand correctly. And you were supposed to give them like so. So you would have the image ID and then you'd predict the five classes, right? So far, this looks like an easy problem, right? Like it's it's just image classification. You just throw a ResNet or an Efficient or a Connex, whatever, should be fine. 
I mean, let's let's jump into the data a bit, and we'll see. First of all, it's a somewhat moderately big data. Although, like, I don't like the word big data, but like on Kaggle competitions, we've seen competitions growing up of a terabyte. This I say is like a moderate size. You can see here there were about fifteen uh, thousand unique individual mammals, and about fifty thousand images. So as you can imagine, there would be some class imbalance. Uh, also, side note: this wasn't an inference competition, so you're given the test images and you could do whatever you wanted locally with them. Another thing worth pointing out: if you look at any of these images, or if you like scroll past any of the images, you'll see that the main fin that you care about, or the head, or the side of the whale, or dolphin, is like a really small part of the complete image. it's it's like a very minute uh, portion of the image and during the initial part of the competition we we'll look at a few discussions but many people ran their models and after visualizing the grad cams they realized oh no this this isn't uh, identifying the part it's supposed to at all it was identifying perhaps the water or something like that so that adds to the challenge in another way let's start with like some light hearted light hearted uh discussion post this was one of my favorites from that time because i was like somewhat moderately active in this competition shout out to darian he's he's an awesome person but he uh took the time to manually give names to every single whale inside the data set i don't know what he did i don't know what model he used for this but it looks like uh it was somewhat manual although like i can imagine uh it's not manual some some of the whales have the same name oh no it's the same id it's the same individual id but anyways this person darian uh, took the time to label every single whale in the image so that's how uh, cool kaglius can be here's another example remek uh, he also has an amazing channel in polish i believe so i would love to watch his video unfortunately there's just in uh, polish language if i understand correctly Shout out to Remek as well. He shared some other photos that you have to deal with, so you can see that this looks like a dolphin next to a whale, and you can see that this one is next to a lot of penguins. Here you can see I don't even know where is the whale. Oh, that's the that's the whale, and this is the sensor. It took me a second to realize that. Here you can see I I assume this is uh something hanging off. intentionally off of this i might be wrong you can see that this image for example this is one of the ones i wanted to point out the whale is like a not even a fraction of the entire image right and based on this or based on what part of the fin you can see from here you are supposed to identify this uh, species so as you can see it's like a really hard problem i was just trying to establish that And I don't even know where the whale is. It looks like that might be it. I might be wrong. And I don't know what this is. It looks like rocks, or it could be fishes. I don't know. So you can see, like it's it's quite quite a hard problem. As as you keep going through more and more of these examples, you that that should be established already, though. Here's another one by Endada. She had uh, taught us this really cool way of plotting confusion matrices in Matplotlib. So by being active in such competition, you don't just learn how to deal with class imbalance, but also such cool things where you can deal with uh, all of this and also learn tricks like how to plot this, which is like I I found this really cool. I don't use Matplotlib, I use Plotly, but if you ask me, this is pretty cool. Here are more posts. Uh, so Andrada did another post showcasing what the dolphins look like. and here are some of the whales i can't tell the difference at all like for some ones it's somewhat obvious like this one looks quite different but if you show me the other images at least to our eye it's like somewhat similar mostly similar to me at least maybe maybe i'm blind maybe all have like a better guess i have no idea but you can see like uh, it's a fine grain problem with a high high class imbalance so now i'm looking at this kernel by i believe osof 
and he actually in this plot you can see the data imbalance and i like this because it's in plotly but uh, you can see it's insanely skewed and you have like a large number of examples in uh, just one of these species which is i'm trying to twist my head and read it's it's bottle nose dolphin all right but you can see there were like about 50000 images and out of those 10000 just exist in this uh 10000 are examples of this species many species have just one image and here's another uh, split between whales and dolphins in the data set a few plots about the image size versus class so uh, that's that's the only plot i wanted to show from this notebook after this he also does a cool tsne plot uh, you can you should read all of osov's kernel for that matter just to learn from him after this let's uh, start by looking at arc phase and matrix learning so i believe by now my instance of hydrogen torch has started i'll do a quick refresher since we looked at this last week i'll i'll be a bit more fast about it here i have hydrogen torch open which was built by people like philip singer uh, pascal who on kaggle is ilu and what i want to remind you all of is uh, how does matrix learning work and different things you can tweak there so let me import a data set for matrix learning uh, i don't want text i want images please we had looked at this exact same example last week as well if you remember so that's why i'll be like a bit faster this time does anyone remember this at all it looked at the bicycle uh, data set which which is the one i'm loading again by the way it's already identified the data frame and the images folders so i can continue from here please be patient all right it's loaded now you can see that uh, all of these are images of the cycle in different angles right i'll hit continue i'll create an experiment out of this create an experiment matrix learning please i'll keep it to novice level just to like uh, fiddle with the minimum number of settings or we can always go to master let's go with master and if anyone has any suggestions to <laughs> for the hyper parameters or options let me know in matrix learning uh, you usually have a class imbalance that you want to deal with or it's most commonly arc phase popped up in phase uh, recognition and that's where gem pooling and all of such terms also came up from so you had last week we had looked at stuff like what is triplet loss uh, all of these things this today we'll look at what is dynamic margin loss uh, all of these words these are key to the top solution then we'll we'll just get to the top solutions after i explain all of this let's see uh, the different things you can work with here i've loaded in the image width and height we'll just let's, let's keep this to the default size you can have different backbones to work with i really like efficient net i think many teams in this competition worked with efficient net gem pooling is also key to such models as i understand and you set arc phase loss you could also have cross entropy which is the case for normal uh, image classification but cl arc phase works better for such cases and you can set the arc phase margin which uh, as the software tells me setting for loss higher values may result in bigger separation from there you can set the optimizer uh, the batch size all of the standard stuff and you can see that i can also decide the matrix to be map uh, which is the one we are working with and i can also enable test time augmentation i'll set top k to a smaller number for this demo and i can now run the experiment so you can see that uh, arc phase models are somewhat similar they have the exact same backbone few things that might be worth tweaking out is setting a gem pooling layer and also um, arc phase loss gets applied to the layer instead of cross entropy to the model instead of cross entropy that is one of the key differences and this model is already being trained if i refresh this it should have started and it will train in about 8 minutes i can take a look and we should have some examples so you can see the learning rate being decayed in a cosine fashion it's not being decayed a lot the graph is zoomed in quite a bit and i can also look at the trained data insights and the validation insights 
after it does the first validation. So that was a quick refresher for metric learning and where it's useful, uh, where you should use ArcPlace laws, all of the standard stuff. Let me switch screen sharing. I'm curious if anyone in the chat had competed in this competition apart from Ayushman. Did any of you all compete in this one? I'm just trying to set up my windows real quick. Cool. I have the right window open now. So this is one of the most popular baselines. It was by Grandmaster KS. This shows you how to run ArcFace on TPU. And it was designed in a way to also be able to run on uh, Colab. The cool thing was this was in TensorFlow, uh, which is quite an insanely hard uh, framework to get used to, uh, to be the least, least controversial when giving an intro to it. And uh, very few, I, as I understand at that time, uh, implementations of a lot of these models were in TensorFlow. So KS had kindly shared this notebook, which allowed people to run all of this on uh, TPUs. And as you can see, this competition had a large number of images. So because of that, uh, it was quite, quite compute intensive. The chat just loaded. I, I was curious why I wasn't getting any chat. So I'll catch up on the messages now. Vadim understands Polish. Is there anything you can't do, Vadim? <laughs> he's, he's an amazing person. Vadim always joins all of the live streams. GPU is equal to hundreds. Nice. <laughs> can anyone use this platform to learn? I, if I understand correctly, for researchers and students, you can reach out and uh, you can get access. Someone is saying hello to Ayushman. Planning to compete in the ASL competition. That's really cool. Oh, I didn't realize Case was his teammate. I, I thought they were like uh, close to each other. We used TensorFlow for gold finish. Did you like TensorFlow? I mean, I know Ayushman is really good with PyTorch. I was curious why I didn't see any chat and then it just loaded all of a sudden. I tried to post a question to the community, but I'm unable to. Uh, Surya, if you could please reach out to me anywhere, I'll have that fixed right after this live stream. That shouldn't have happened, although. Uh, I'll, I'll look into it after the live stream. Cool. So this notebook, uh, there's nothing that stands out here, except that it's, it's in TensorFlow. It works with GCS buckets uh, and teaches everyone how to work with it. It's the standard uh, arc phase implementation we had looked at a bunch of these last week and i don't want to go through tensorflow code more than anyone else so i'll just point out the fact that this was one of the most popular notebooks you can see by the number of merges here this allowed everyone to use tpus which was really key uh in this competition just to like run all of this data set any people also looked at ways of uh, removing the background so earlier we saw there was all of this background noise. For, so for example, if you're trying to identify me, it might be easy uh, to identify a human. Or let's say I'm just in the corner. It might be useful to just like remove everything else. Right? So uh, that's what this kernel showcases you. This is one of the techniques. Aishman has a comment about TensorFlow and how hard it is to learn. You can see you can match uh, using LOFTR feature matching. If you don't know what this is, there's another kernel showcasing how that works. And it was by Remick as well. But it uh, is basically doing key point matching. This is a technique used in traditional CV. So if you go to open CVs documentation, you'll see some things like this. And using this technique, he showcases you how you can remove the background and extract this. Uh, fun fact, if you have an iPhone, I'm sure this is an Android, so I don't want to start a war here. 
but if you are on the latest version of iOS you can uh, tap and hold yourself on the images and it'll do the exact same thing it, i'm sure it uses a different algorithm but you can sort of extract yourself and create a whatsapp sticker out of it if you want to be trolled in groups or what not <laughs> i do that to all of my friends but you can see this is how it it's implemented in code and it's always cool to see how you can create such uh, models so this could have been one approach you could have extracted all of these and created this data set so that your model could be forced to focus on all of these while trying to come up with the answers and the top 5 classes i wanted to show some more analyses but we've already covered them so i'll move past this another way was using bounding boxes from yolo v5 and showcase these bounding boxes right around uh, the whales tail etc etc and you could have used this info to crop into the data set as well right and there was this uh, approach i had pointed out earlier loftr which was implemented in cornea if you knew to cornea it's a really cool framework uh, for a lot of things in pytorch and computer vision you should you should definitely check it out this notebooks uh, explains some details about how to do feature matching with transformer that's the paper and it allows you to somewhat map these points together uh, and surf is another technique that's somewhat popular so in this notebook uh, remek had shown how you can do that another cool thing that uh, hang had pointed out here he said he spent some time looking at a lot of notebooks and they were wrong because uh, some didn't implement them correctly and it took him a week to discover that uh, you should use batch norm or layer norm before l2 to make the models work correctly this is one of the key learnings right like when uh, machine learning models fail they don't give out error messages they just don't work and even though your code runs and sometimes it takes a long while to run uh, it's it just doesn't work properly is this all done on kaggle as i find the image limiting what are the first few steps one needs to do when working on image competitions so i had shown this notebook by ks like 2 minutes ago that taught you how to work on tpus uh, and it's easy to ask access for tpus and work on them and they they are insanely fast so like a tpu pod is quite comparable to i don't know or like dgx box or something like that so you can you can look at uh, tpus good resource to start your journey in computer vision just so you sign up for any competition you you learn the most there and there was another comment that i wanted to highlight here by uh, my colleague sai most of the time there's no wrong or right in ml you just try all options and see what works best there was another cool problem in the competition where some of the labels weren't identified correctly so alexi had fixed this problem and pointed out that you can correct the labels like so this doesn't matter now because I, as i understand the data set has been fixed but uh, this was one of the other problems that came up during the initial few weeks phalanx had shared this uh, crop data set using detic detic is a model for as i understand object detection detic train classification head clip embeddings on image net weekly supervised version he shared some details about the model uh so this was one of the data sets that i assume might have been key for this competition where you had like cropped and all to into all of the fins and the details of the whales and dolphins so this was a data set that had been shared i i believe a few more of these had been posted but as you can see that this was also key to like make your model focus on the parts instead of trying to figure out how to make it learn on a very large insanely large image this was one of the approaches that many teams used and you can see that it's important to do that for all such cases where you have penguins people 
लार्ज लैंडस्केप एंड क्लिप बोर्ड दिस वॉज अ रियली पॉपुलर डेटा सेट बिकॉज आई थिंक इट वॉज की सो जैनब्रे हैड शेयर द डेटा सेट फॉर डॉसल फिन आई एज्यूम दे हैड लाइक आइडेंटिफाइड एंड लेबल्ड ऑल ऑफ दिस He had manually labeled forty five hundred back fins, which is really cool to see. Here's another such data set. As you can see, these are like insanely popular, and many people ended up creating all of these. It's not just for data set points; it's because it was important for the competition, as you can see. Is this font size good for everyone? Should I zoom in a bit? Let's still zoom in. I think. This should be okay. Can someone please confirm if this is good enough? I'm just waiting for the chat to confirm or not. I'll continue and I'll 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 check the messages in a second. So, uh, Oleg had done some LB probing and shared some interesting info. Eighteen percent of the images had one photo only. sorry 18% of the individual ids had one photo only and if data was randomly spread you might need to account for all of this and there are about 3000 new individual photos this is another challenge manish is saying it's better now thanks manish this was another challenge that in the test set you had some uh, new classes and you were supposed to label them as new individuals So I'd also you were also supposed to figure out how to account for that. Here are some tips for improving score. And someone had earlier asked, I believe Manish had asked how to work with larger image sizes. Here you can see that TensorFlow and Collab or TensorFlow TPU is really fast. Gem pooling, uh, they say, worked better. ArcFace performed better. these are some general tricks i believe but like the first one was just to point out that that's important these are some tricks for improving your score so whenever you increase the size of course your model uh, works better because it has more info to play with and batch size this person says they're not sure about which part of batch size helps in model performance anyways large batch size gave him an improvement and of course always ensembling different architectures is a good idea so now let's take a look at the scores and how people had set up their validations so this was a single fold setup uh, different image sizes and efficient net 5768 size single fold in tensorflow gives the highest cv it looks like and what was this this is also the same thing right I guess he's like using different models. Do we need to buy a Collab Pro to use TPUs? I have no idea. Collab Pro. It's taking a second to load. Hundred compute units. Faster GPUs. There's no mention of TPU here. Search for TPU. I don't see TPU here. Oh. Ashman is saying arc face really depends a lot on batch size. Could you share? Is it like is it sensitive to some batch size ranges? or is it like lower is better or you like you have to fit the largest that works the best i'm asking ayushman because he had finished 7th in this competition and that's why like all of us were calling him a cv champ earlier and in another post darian shares that how he had messed up setting up uh, the validation strategy and it was just like a very simple approach and this is also to see that like really hard working kaglers can also mess such things up right so another like source of inspiration 
this is another cool thing i wanted to point out so darian had labeled all of the images this person made a embedding plot <laughs> and you can see it's like a fish i wouldn't call it a dolphin it, it does look how I, i would draw a fish probably not stable diffusion but this is how i would at least draw a fish by the way side note i have been working on a stable diffusion study group that should happen sometime so i don't know how excited you all are about that but uh, that might start in a few weeks i am also working with a few experts to learn about it and it'll be a study group chai time style so you can expect that to happen in a few weeks avishman is saying large batch size is better for embeddings thanks thanks avishman that makes sense tp is always also available in standard colab thanks for that ai5 Hmm. I have no idea about Colab, and I don't. I don't intend to check it. So I'm sorry, I can't help you with that. I wanted to point some things out, but after reading the solution, I don't think it's as relevant. So this post by Sinan was a recap of top solutions from the previous fail competition. This post teaches you how to take the arc phase baseline from a really low score to a high score, and this is worth pointing out because uh, many Kagglers land on very high positions like so. So they take a public notebook and like sincerely improve upon it. They really digest the code, really try to figure everything out. So. this person had used gcp but they say kaggle should be fine surya have you tried uh, using the tpus on kaggle why not just do that unless you are like always running out of the, the quota there i think you can just use tpus on kaggle so here the summary of changes he had increased the image size he had changed the model to a b5 with noisy student training he had used a concat pooling from fastai So here's some code. Average pooling is equal to global average pooling. Max pooling is equal to global max pooling. And after that, pre-trained out is equal to concatenate both of these. All right, that makes sense. So he's concatenating both of these layers. Added dual head model to for species classification output and metric. So one head would have been focused on species classification and another one on the metric. I assume. It also changed the metric function, increased the embedding size, used a cleaner data set, used pseudo labeling. So pseudo labeling was also really key in this competition, as I understand. He shared some augmentation as well that worked well. And other things remain quite unchanged. So you can see that uh, Lex had taken this notebook and really. optimize the heck out of it and that is also how you can like really go high on the leaderboard so many times you have to like really experiment new ideas like avishman uh, created a dolg that's the name of the paper he created a dolg army as he calls it i think that was their team name but you can also do such stuff where you can just optimize things here's another trick to improve your score using focal loss instead of cross entropy loss inside arc phase and this is something i pointed out just when we were starting earlier and of course this competition made everyone uh, in a everyone wait in a really long tpu queue because kagglers of course uh, would have hopped on a lot of tpus i think that's enough knowledge to understand the background now let's dive into some top solutions I'll give it a shot again and update. I think on Kaggle it should work. We were talking about TPUs or context to others. Cool. I'll take a look at the leaderboard and then we'll look at different solutions. By the way, I had interviewed the fourth place uh, team solution, so I interviewed Bo particularly, and you can find that interview somewhere on the streams. here it is i'll i'll put this link in the description or i'll uh, put it as a comment later but in this video bo had shared his approach his team's approach so i'll probably point you all to this instead of going into a lot of depth for the fourth place one 
but this was a really nice interview as well for uh, from someone who was really high on the leaderboard and whenever you see chishan and bo together chishan works at s2 but i i always joke with him whenever i see him with bo that means like the one gold position is always gone because they they are always on top somewhere here is ayushman's team dolg army on seventh position so the highest score was 0.875 and the lowest gold was 0.849 so between point somewhere in like 0.85 range is basically a safe gold for this competition i'm pointing that out because it's important to know that when reading the solutions i also see team hydrogen with a different name here this beluja as well uh, competing on a whale competition <laughs> all puns intended cool i just wanted to look at where everyone was in the leaderboard let's start by reading the first place solution now they say uh, their solution was based on sub center arc phase with dynamic margins for those that don't know dynamic margins basically is referring to uh, having dynamic number of classes being fed to it as i understand ayushman please correct me if i'm wrong but as i understand dynamic here doesn't refer to the batch size doesn't refer to image size or anything like that i think it's the number of classes being fed to the model so whenever you see dynamic arc phase or such models that is what it's referring to sorry dynamic margins is referring to that which was shown to be effective in google landmark recognition competition and the first place so all of these are quite important in doing something known as retrieval i'll take a second to explain that and usually you have steps to it's similar to like database terminology where you're doing a lookup so you could have a global lookup you could have a local lookup this technique did like a mix of both of them so that is the dolg paper and in winning this competition dieter had implemented it by himself but that was the key in this paper which i think applied uh, to the other one as well from here you people learned that arc phase head with dynamic margins was important and bo had also done the same thing we introduced dynamic margins a family of continuous functions mapping class size to image margin level this uh, gave them some major boost in another competition called google landmark so here you have to identify landmarks and images and we looked at some kernels early, earlier right where you, if you remember there was like those green lines being drawn those are also landmarks so landmarks are features on the images it's just not literal landmarks when you do such land map mapping or uh, i'm trying to remember the technical word for it but you can look up the loftr paper or all of these things you can assume that these techniques would translate really well on the competition as well so the, this was key for the team for winning this competition below he summarizes his pipeline and both of them were in a team so i, I assume charm had shared his details as well somewhere else i don't think so cool so here are some of the details of their model they had tuned the dynamic margin hyperparameters with optuna created a larger used a larger learning rate bounding box mixing augmentation ensemble of knn and logits and two round of pseudo labeling pseudo labeling was also key in this competition and many teams top teams ended up using pseudo labeling and they had ensemble many data sets they say they had used several types of bounding boxes to crop images for training they randomly mixed several bounding boxes with the ratio of full body to full body charm this was i assume a different data set to backfin to retic to none with the following ratio so this is how they did this blending of bounding boxes 
and finally they cropped the images cropped images resize to fix size so they had resized all of this to 1024 by 1024 for backbones and necks they say they had used several pre-trained backbones b5 b6 and b7 b2 and b2 medium and large the best performance for single model was b7 they share for gem pooling they had used p is equal to 3 instead of uh, gap enhanced the performance so gp is another layer but they say using gem pooling helped them here can i elaborate on pseudo labeling sure so uh, pseudo labeling works like this you have a model but you have some unlabeled data set i see a competition master who had won a gold in this competition in the chat I don't know what I'll do with my life once Nishche becomes a grandmaster because I'll have to figure something new out. Anyways, so pseudo labeling is when you have some unlabeled data and you have a pre-trained model. You will run inference on that data and you'll get the labels and you'll use those labels with the data. So it's it's not really the ground truth. It's pseudo labels because you have used a model to label all of those. Oh, thanks for that. Gap means global average pooling. Thanks for pointing that out, Aishman. The normalization layer before arc face head was important. Uh, Heng had pointed this out in another discussion. Batch norm was slightly better than layer norm in our experiment. So in that discussion, Heng said you could use either, but for them they say batch norm was better. In addition to the final feature map of the backbone, they used the second final feature map to capture more local information. They simply concatenated those two gem pool feature maps and passed them to the head. For handling higher imbalance, they adopted arc face with dynamic margins. Since it seemed sensitive to hyperparameters, they tuned it using Optuna. And even on smaller images, I assume they tuned on small images because it runs fast, but that did work but, but, uh, equally good enough for large images, they say. In the last competition, uh, I assume they're talking about humpback. It was reported that handling flipped images significantly enhanced the performance. In this competition, they did not think this would work because images are taken from different angle. To handle this, they adopted the sub-center arc phase of k is equal to 2 with usual flipped data augmentation. So they, I, what, that, what this means is they tuned the arc phase with data augmentation and trained on it basically. They'd also added a second head for classifying species. Sub-center arc face with dynamic margins worked better than a simple linear head. Some details about their training. While we mainly checked a single fold validation score locally, we trained our models by using whole train data for submission. Setting the learning rate of the head 10 times bigger than the learning rate of the backbone significantly improved the performance. Hmm. This makes sense, right? Like head is the outermost part and you'd have a larger learning rate there. Although usually like there's no, there's no ground rule for it, but uh, many people do one third, one third, one third for differential learning rates. They say that their setup was quite more aggressive than that, which is cool to see. Optimal training settings differ possibly due to slight difference. So uh, the author had trained the model for 30 epochs with Hardam optimizer. Charm had trained for 20 epochs. They share some details about their augmentation strategy. Uh, I don't think anything stands out here. Finally, they say they combined the following two matrix, K and N using feature vectors. They calculated the largest cosine similarity for each class. This can be done for each model and is easier to ensemble many models. They share some detail about the logic, uh, the other approach. We use the simple output of the model without margins. So they had combined the following two matrix. 
is there a site other than kaggle and gola which gives free gpus for training i don't think so ashish this is some other details pseudo labeling enhances the public score a lot probably because of the imbalanced data the second round of pseudo labeling on the final day also improved their score so you can see that it got them to gold we had looked at 0.85 being the gold score their final submission had 50 models including the ones trained without pseudo labeling and first round of pseudo labeling after the competition they confirmed that ensemble of just two models scored a really good score which would still win the first place what did not work four channel uh, images with segmentation mark six channel images combining two types of images having crop data some other details connect surprisingly didn't work for them and here is their code if you'd like to dive a bit more could you help me understand when you say participate in the competition to learn better how should i do it just go to any kernel tweak it as much as you can to get a higher score and once you have done that uh, go to discussion see what other people are doing look at other kernels blend that approach after you've done this you'd already have a lot of ideas but don't just like tune the hyperparameters really just understand the code after the stage all of us just start by tuning the hyperparameters it's completely fine nothing wrong with that sometimes you can also win gold medals with that for <laughs> competitions that have weird data sets although that's like another story but just start there and go from there there's no like there's no curriculum of kaggle there's no curriculum of data science if i may it's like all all experimental so like don't don't wait to do courses or stuff like that cool so that was the first place solution if i am to re summarize it the trick from google landmark was really key here they had also figured out the hyperparameters down to the detail they had created two heads and used custom image augmentation in post processing also they had combined two matrix so that was the first place solution this is the second place solution and they had used the data set i had shown earlier for cropping is they saying my workstation are free computer resources i mean like my utilities bill is more than my <laughs> rent at this point so they had used that data set we had looked at earlier the one with the cropping and they say without it they couldn't have achieved this they say for single model they talk about the data set two different data sets were created using yolo v5 and yolo x all models were trained using the full body data set before the last day finally a few models were fine tuned with a few epochs on the yolo x model this is cool to see i haven't like i have seen this elsewhere but not on an image competition this was this was a technique used in feedback if i remember correctly but not uh, not in other competitions efficient at large worked best for them and they shared some details about the training recipe finally they talk about pseudo labeling this is key to getting a high score on the leaderboard we use the fully connected layer prediction like so of train models to generate pseudo labels the confidence threshold was set to 0.8 every pseudo labeling round was from imagenet weights so that used imagenet weights and uh, changed the fc layer prediction with this slight augmentation to get the labels here they share their scores and they finally talk about their ensembles they talk about some performance tips the first one being gradient checkpointing and they talk about using ngc containers if i understand correctly yes so if this is by the way this is like a really pro tip if i may that ayushman taught me and i have like used ever since on local gpus if you have one if you don't have one don't worry about it i think most cloud vendors have this figured out but on local gpus 
use the nvidia docker images they are much much more optimized and will always give you a boost of like 10 to 30% which is quite large right like that means your training can go from 3 days to 2 days at times yeah i don't don't count on my arithmetic yeah they say for them it was 20% fast cool so this was the second place solution and you can see the key bit if i may here was uh, first of all fine tuning training on one data set and fine tuning it to another custom data set that they had created and then doing pseudo labeling was the key here our current kaggle playground series worth participating if you are asking that competition it sounds like you're not interested right because if you are interested in a competition you wouldn't ask and if you want to learn uh, you would just participate in any competition i mean like uh, what i do is or what i would suggest you do is just go to any competition where the problem statement excites you enough and just jump on that competition so uh, just commit to any competition spend half an hour every day on any competition for 3 months it will uh, really really skyrocket your learning and you'll find that you end up spending more than half an hour eventually but at that point you're already learning third place solution this is a part of it the total solution can be found here so let's go to that this is the entire solution looks like yes this is by lafe they say congratulation to all winners they share some details about the data set generation no, i don't want i don't want notifications uh, 5000 plus body label strain yolo v5 predict on train data set threshold that relabel and retrain so they generate this custom data set uh, create bounding boxes from it use the pseudo labels to retrain the data that makes sense they first randomly labeled about 5000 bodies as we just looked at next they use label bodies to train a salient detector next they use a train detector to predict and then they use the pseudo labels to train the detector again they talk about a embedding extractor set gen uh, setting general pipelines ashish is saying thanks most welcome ashish they use the whale body detector mentioned about to predict the test set if the number of boxes is not equal to 1 we adjust the detector score threshold and the image resolution for the images with multiple bounding boxes we crop those boxes and get their embeddings and then computed the cosine similarity they share the details about what models they had used so this was i think one of the first teams that used pytorch surya is saying he'll drop me a message show sure thing surya please do and here are some details about the image size embedding size hyperparameters feature space constraint that use a backbone with gem pooling uh, bnn neck arc face with the following parameters or ada face this is the first time i'm looking at ada face because arc face only measures cosine angle the feature space does not carry on the distance constraint therefore we use bnn neck what is this what is this repository um bag of tricks from cvpr i know of the paper bag of tricks and a strong reid baseline oh this had one another challenge not on kaggle i assume but they had used this technique they talk about nfnet backbone the augmentations they had used and some tricks finally they talk about pseudo labeling So first step one body data is used to train the model after multifold model stacking pseudo labels are obtained on test set we further use the pseudo labels from step one to train part and body models then do stacking ensemble 
so they had not only used the pseudo labeling earlier but also in in this approach so train without pseudo body model merge it just threshold i'll zoom in a bit pseudo on high threshold train body with pseudo uh, use these pseudo labels to again train the body model and then they had used both of these pseudo labels to create another final model cool so you can see that they had done this like multi level um if i may pseudo labeling is that a word multi label pseudo labeling i don't know so it looks like their key the key to the solution was uh, this really nice way of doing pseudo labeling and of course they had used uh, and fine tuned the heck out of all of these arc face models but it looks like the key part was at least to me it looks like it was the pseudo labeling i have already interviewed bo about their solution so i pointed everyone out to the interview after just after just ending this live stream i'll have it under the like button so you can just look at the description and watch that interview if you want bo also shares how you should approach such competitions and how you can start fresh on such competitions in that interview So if you want you can also watch that but I'll skip past this in interest of time Let's look at the sixth place solution So he also used the data set by Jan and he used the full body and back fin data I also used the results of training the detector using Jan's annotation there were two different boxes for full body and back fin he had used with a slightly larger box as a result a fairly diverse set of data was used for was used as material for ensemble for validation since i started working with tensorflow late and was short on time i took the approach of training with all trains and checking scores on lb this is this is the best way right this is the only way validating on leaderboard i'm just kidding this is like this can be risky but uh, i assume he had figure out that this might have been okay at that point one more question i am well versed with tensorflow but i want to learn about pytorch implementation uh, just implement anything you know in tensorflow to pytorch after looking at the documentation don't waste your time watching lectures i have made 15 videos on it and i'm going to say don't watch them because if you know tensorflow you can just look at the documentation and do that just look at the pytorch documentation and put your code Here are some details about his models. Uh, nothing stands out, and some PyTorch model details as well. During inference, they had compared the similarity of concatenated feature map between train and test. The dimension of final feature map exceeded twenty thousand. Different thresholds were used to determine new individuals. He had also done pseudo labeling by using pseudo labeling. i can see not only the train but also similarity to confident test set so he had also done pseudo labeling and he doesn't share any details about that he says uh, working in a cat cafe greatly improved the score for him do we do we have cat cafes in india i don't think so i mean i know they're not from india <laughs> cool so pseudo labeling was key here as well and this approach of creating the data set was also part of the secret sauce we have about two more minutes so i'll go through the last solution for today which is the seventh place and this is by ayushman so ayushman if you have any comments I, you will regardless spam the chat why am i like even calling you out So their team name was DOLG because they had used this approach called DOLG, which is a paper, and they had trained a lot of models to that. Their solution consists of the following major components: data recipe, modeling, progressive pseudo labeling, post processing, and ensembling. All of their models are trained on TPUs using the same pipeline that KS had shared. So for data recipe, there were different data sets available publicly, which they said could help with diversity. They decided to make their own data recipe by using the combination of different data sets, and they had also used some augmentation there. 
for models they had used a combination of dolg with fnet backbone normal fnets with curricular face loss and they had they had used uh, dito's implementation and they had ported that to tensorflow because it worked better they also use multiple heads in the model one for species classification and another for individual classification species classification head was trained with normal softmax loss while the individual was trained with curricular face loss they share all of the models they had used for the final ensemble sorry the final submission ensemble i assume during post processing they had used a second stage model for getting better confidence score the idea was to use predictions or features to get a better confidence score than just the nearest distance so dolg was on nearest distance kurian is saying we do have cat uh, cafes here but they are not as cool so when you are doing this landmark matching you create embeddings and these are in high dimensionalities but assume they are in 3d for a second so let's say you have chai embedding and you have siam embedding in 3d both of them would be really close so you can measure their distance and by that virtue you can say that these are the same class so you can say siam is equal to chai but uh, if you would have coffee that just wouldn't exist in this 3d plane so that is how all of these models work i should have pointed that out earlier but uh, you create this embedding of all of the features of the images and usually have a large number of them and you just do a sim simple uh, distance measure between them so in the second stage they had done some fancy different stuff beyond that to get better confidence scores for the mod, uh, for the images they had trained five folds of xgb and light gbm models on the above features which are the probabilities the nearest distance distance from centroid and rank of each unique individual id present in the candidate sum of the three neighbor distance for the ensemble they had used a simple weighted voting approach which were optimized for five folds so looks like the main key was using dolg and combining different data sets there uh, for all of these things in this solution we're out of time i wanted to cover the other gold solutions but i think we can wrap up here again uh, thanks everyone for watching i am working on a stable diffusion uh, study group that will happen sometime soon where did ayushman execute his tpu codes on uh, tfrc's tpus so you can apply for tpu access through tfrc and i assume that's what they, these guys had done they mention in the solution somewhere anyways i i am working on a stable diffusion study group so keep an eye out for that uh, on saturdays if you want we are also going through this book so you're welcome to join that study group regardless next weekend we'll look at the top solutions from rsna which ends in a few days and we'll also look at nfl solutions so i don't know which one we'll do first but i'll i'll of course do some interviews and we'll learn more from the top solutions thanks for watching i'll see you all next week at the same time